All right, Tony. Tony, uh, where'd you grow up? Where are you from originally? Southern California, um, in the Inland Empire. All over the Inland Empire, moved around a lot as a kid. Like Riverside, San Bernardino. Riverside, San Bernardino, Fontana, yeah. Um, I spent a couple years in New Mexico, um, ended up moving there when I was around 15. And I also traveled back and forth uh, every summer, so um, have some roots in New Mexico as well. What was your uh, childhood like with your family? Um, my childhood was pretty good from the outside looking in. Um, had some things going on in my childhood that would eventually lead me to a sexual addiction, a drug addiction, an alcohol addiction. Um, but these are things that, I, that I've done a pretty good job of, of keeping bottled up. Uh, in fact, some of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about today, I've never openly talked about with anybody. Um, but from the outside looking in, it, it was good. What was your relationship like with your mom and dad? Uh, mom and dad, uh, quick backstory on them. They, uh, they met while my father was locked up. My mom started writing him letters. Uh, once he got out, they got together at a young age, like 17. Uh, but they ended up divorcing uh, when I was one, so I never actually saw my parents together. But I've always had a great relationship with both of them. Um, I always say that I grew up on both sides of the fence. Um, life with my father and life with my mother were, were two very different uh, experiences. Uh, Which was, a, your dad was the bad one? My dad was... Uh, the devil on one shoulder and your mom was the angel? Yeah, something like that. My, my dad was a great father, not, not to get that you know, misunderstood, but I could get away with a lot more with my father. I experienced a lot more with my father. My mother was, was more strict. Um, she monitored what I watched, what I listened to, where I was. She knew my friends. She knew what I was doing at all times. Kind of tried to keep me in bubble wrap, so to speak. How far did you go in school? Say again? How far did you go in school? Uh, graduated high school, never went to college. Um, I joined the military right out of high school. I was in the Navy for two and a half years. I was supposed to be in for four, uh, but I did two and a half years. In you stayed the, out of trouble? In the military? In, the hi in high school? In high school, uh, no. High school is, is where trouble started for me. Um, What'd you get into? A lot of partying, a um, lot of sex, a lot of sleeping around, um, experiment with drugs, uh, cocaine, ecstasy, molly. Um, Growing up, uh, most of the men that I was influenced by in my family all served a significant amount of time in prison, uh, gang members, drug dealers. So at one point in my life, I thought that that was the route I wanted to take. Um, I thought that that's what I needed to be in order to be respected, in order to be a tough guy. Um, so I, I dabbled in that area, uh, never joined a gang, but uh, I got into um, gang activity, um, stealing, breaking into places I shouldn't have been, uh, fighting, things of that nature. Never went to, never went to prison. And then, so in your 20s, you, you, got, you did some time? No, 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 never, never went to prison. I've been to jail, I've done some overnighters, but never went to prison. Oh, I see, okay. And then tell me about your 20s. My 20s, um, 20s was uh, was wild. I was I was doing a lot of drugs. I was um, I was partying a lot. Uh, kicked out of the navy, uh, and that had a lot to do with my sexual addiction and, and my alcohol intake. Uh, that got me kicked out of the military. Um, kind of just lost in my 20s. Didn't know who I was. Didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, bouncing around a lot from um, living situations to jobs. Um, just really trying to search for myself and uh, trying to figure myself out, um, getting through the addictions. But the addictions started uh, at a much younger age. What do you think the addictions, the worst of your addictions were? Um, I would say, I would say the sexual addiction was was the strongest one. Um, but that is what brought in the drugs and the alcohol, and then it all was just intertwined and. Um, there's two particular things in my, in my childhood that I think uh, brought me there that, you know, am amounted to that. What do you think happened in your childhood that directed um, your life? The first thing, I, I would say the foundation of, of a lot of my problems, a lot of my insecurities, a lot of, um, you know, I had, a, I had a major wall built up at a young age. Um, I had a stepfather that uh, came into my life when I was three, and um, he was a bully. He was, he was abusive verbally and physically. Um, he would 
he would always call me a little boy. Don't do that little boy. He'd always point at me. Don't do that little boy. Don't talk to me like that little boy. And uh, he would punch me square in my chest, push me down to the ground. He did this thing where he would pull my ear and he would pull me all the way down to the ground and then he would dig his knee into my side and he would scold me that way, um, throw me around. Um, but it was, what made it worse is that, um, you know, I had to walk on eggshells with him. There was times where he was really cool. There was times where he, where he played the part well, the, the loving stepfather. Um, but in any moment, that could change. And um, obviously had some issues of his own, and, uh, and I was the one he took it out on. So at a young age, I, I became very insecure, very timid, uh, didn't know how to make friends. Um, it didn't help that I moved around a lot as a kid. I went to a couple different elementary schools, two different middle schools, three different high schools. So making friends was always hard and um, just didn't fit in as a young kid, got bullied, got jumped um, on the way home from school, things like that. I mean, a parent like that is, is so destructive for a kid's it is. self-worth. It is, it is, yeah. I, I, I must have felt like I couldn't do anything right. Um, I remember growing up, I always had good ideas. I always had good thoughts. I always had good input but I never let it out because I had no confidence, no confidence as a kid whatsoever. Um, it didn't help that I was getting bullied at home and at school. So as a young kid, I just completely shut down. Um, and then things started to change for me around 15 years old. Um, once I was 15, I, well, the, the thing with my stepdad, that stopped around 13. Um, you know, I always wondered, you, you hear this often with kids that are, that are abused at home, a lot of times you hear that they don't say anything, they don't speak up. And um, I think personally, it's because either they're afraid of the outcome or they just don't know that their situation is a situation. You know, if, you know, he was my stepfather since I was three and that was all I knew. So maybe I didn't necessarily know that I had a shitty stepfather until I got older. Once I was 13, um, I finally told my dad and I think around this age, I started to realize who my dad was. My dad was a, was a thug. He was a tough guy, um, not to be messed with. And so I finally told my dad what was going on. And um, I don't remember if he called my stepdad personally or if he called my mother, but um, he said, the next time you put your hands on my boy, I'm gonna fly to California and I'm gonna kill you. And um, that was when it finally stopped, um, the abuse from my stepfather. Um, and then when I was 15, um, I decided to move out of California and go live with my father in New Mexico. Um, I think I was ready to have uh, my dad in my life every day. There was things that I needed to be taught. I needed to be taught how to defend myself, how to fight, how to work on a car, you know, things, things that your father should, should teach you. And uh, because when I was getting bullied in school and bullied at home, I, I wasn't a fighter. And, you know, I, I was more afraid to fight. I, I, didn't, I didn't want any, any issues. Um, so when I was 15, I moved to New Mexico, Las Cruces, New Mexico, to live with my father. And um, at this time, I was, uh, I was a good boy. I was curious. I was always curious because my mother kept me from things, you know. I wasn't allowed to see certain people in my family. I wasn't allowed to stay the night with certain cousins. Um, I wasn't allowed to cuss. I wasn't allowed to watch movies with sex or cussing. I wasn't allowed to listen to music with cussing. And so I think that always made me curious for those things, you know? Um, so I was curious, but I was a good kid. I didn't get in a lot of trouble at, yet at this age. I was a virgin. I had no plans on having sex yet. Um, my mother told me at a young age that if I had sex before marriage, I'd go to hell. And, and I believed that. That's what my mom told me and I believed it. So um, she put the fear of God in me and uh, I had no plans on having sex until marriage. Uh, but when I was 15, I was living with my dad, and this is when the, the second most significant thing in my childhood happened. Um, we had a neighbor that lived next door, and there was like four young girls, a brother, a mom, and a dad, and they were all my age. We were all, you know, 14, 15 years old. And, um, and we would play with these, these kids, you know. We would go to the house all the time. We were always at the house. These, this is who we played with on the block. Um, and we were curious kids. Uh, we would play truth or dare, stuff like that, make out in the closet, things like that, uh, but pretty innocent for the most part. One day, I um, walked over to the, to the house to see if anybody was home, knocked on the door, and uh, the mother answered the door. 
And uh, later on in life, I found out that she was actually an illegal immigrant. She barely spoke any English, but enough to get through a conversation, but very choppy. And um, she said, nobody's home, but you can come inside and you can wait if you want um, until the kids get home. And that, that wasn't strange. You know, I, I, I was at this house every day. The mother would cook dinner for us and stuff like that. So it wasn't strange. So I went inside and um, as soon as I walk in the door, there's a couch to the right. So as soon as I come in, I sit down on the couch and she says, why don't you come in my room and wait with me? So I said, okay. So I got up and walked into the room with her. And um, she said, why don't you sit down on the bed with me? And I, at this moment, I realized that this is getting a little personal. Um, so I remember my heart beating out of my chest. I was nervous. I knew something was off, but I was curious about it. And uh, so I sat on the bed and um, she turned on the TV and, and it was a full blown hardcore pornography film. And at this age, um, I had seen magazines, Maxim magazines, Playboy magazines, but I've never seen a porno like this before. So she introduced me to that. She turned it on and uh, just started watching it with me. She asked me if I liked it. I said, yeah, I like it. And um, she said, why don't you lay down? So I laid down on the bed. She got down off her side of the bed, walked over to where I was and she started massaging my shoulders, my chest, my legs. And then um, she stuck her hand down my pants and uh, started to massage me. And uh, she asked me if I liked it. And I said, yeah, I like it. And uh, she, uh, she pulled my dick out and she started giving me head. And that was the first time that I've ever felt that, ever experienced that. And um, I remember being extremely nervous, um, but I liked it. it, it felt great. And um, it was the first time I experienced any of this. Um, I wrote about this uh, situation in a song. Um, I wanna share the lyrics with you. Uh, before I continue on with the story, I said, uh, I said, I was 15, she was 36. I give to her my innocence. This filthy bitch put a filthy flick, put a silky lips right on my dick. Admittedly, I was nervous. I never felt this. I like it. I love it. She fucked me. I'm ruined. She is selfish. A rotted seed planted by the devil himself. For this seed would grow like weeds, contaminate to oneself. Forbidden fruit, forbidden you, forget to spit out this pitiful. You bit the sweet deceit, discreet defeat is at your feet. Satisfaction, grasp it quicker than a New York minute. Stupid you consumed up in it, switch and meet your doom within it. Hit your knees, hold crucifixes, too suspicious, who can fix this? I'm a nuisance, plead forgiveness, hit my knees right after she did. And that's the only time that I've ever spoke on this situation. Um, it's an older song. It's a song I put out when I first started making music. So a lot of people haven't even heard this song. Um, but to get- How old to, are you now? 33. So you carried this with you all these years. Yeah. Um, I think for a long time, I just uh, pretended like it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't until much later in life, and, and I'll, I'll get there in the story, that I realized, wow, I can't believe that I went through that and didn't think it was you know, a big deal. Um, so she, uh, she said, I don't have time right now. Um, the kids and my husband will be home soon, but I want you to come back later tonight and I'll, I'll let you in the back door and I'll show you more. So I said, okay. So I came back that night. The husband was gone. He worked nights. The kids were all asleep and she brought me in through the back door and, um, and she showed me how to have sex. I lost my virginity to this woman. Uh, she was 21 years older than me. She showed me how to have sex. She showed me different positions. She showed me how to penetrate deeper. Um, she showed me how to please her. I think that was, that was her main objective, to teach this, this young boy how to please me. And, um, and uh, I became addicted to that feeling, everything I felt that day. Um, you know, imagine being a 15-year-old a boy, a good kid, a virgin, hadn't seen pornography yet or nothing like that. And all in a matter of 20 minutes, I'm introduced to all of this. And uh, she opened up that door, you know, for the devil to come in. And, and uh, he didn't just come in quietly, he busted down the door and came in with friends, you know. And um, so that was the start of my sexual addiction. I, I, I wanted that feeling all the time. I thought about sex all the time. I became addicted to pornography. Um, I remember living at my dad's house. We didn't have uh, internet, we didn't have Wi-Fi. I had a, a PSP, a PlayStation Portable, 
and you could use the internet on those things. Um, we didn't have Wi-Fi, but the neighbor across the street did. So I would sneak out in the middle of the night and I would sit in front of the neighbor's house and steal the Wi-Fi to download pornography. And um, even worse than that, uh, you know, we lived in the desert. There wasn't a lot in Las Cruces yet. It was a lot of just open desert. And when we were kids, we would walk through the desert looking for snakes and lizards and stuff. But uh, I started to find porn magazines scattered throughout the desert everywhere. And my only guess is it, that they were left behind from homeless people. And uh, so after a while, I would stop looking for lizards and snakes, and I started going into the desert just to collect these magazines, and I'd bring them home and keep them. Dirty magazines left behind from homeless people, and I'd go looking for them and bring them home and keep them. That's crazy. Um, so porn addiction, um, sexual addiction, and what I experienced that day was forbidden fruit, is, is the way I, that I like to explain it. She was married. She was 21 years older than me. Um, she was the mother to my friends. And, and I had to sneak around, you know, to have this relationship with her. So everything about, about it was forbidden. And so as my sexual addiction grew, it wasn't enough for me to just have sex with women. I, I wanted something forbidden. I wanted that chase. I wanted something I wasn't supposed to have. And that, that ruined a lot of relationships, a lot of friendships. I've, I've slept with friends, girlfriends, friends, wives, um, friends, sisters, sisters of sisters, my sister's friends, a lot of married women. Are forbidden relationships the only ones that interest you? No, I wouldn't say the only ones, but it was definitely what made me feel that adrenaline again, that adrenaline rush that I was that I was searching for. I had, you know, regular relationships, um, but those ones made me feel different. Uh, I, I think it somehow made me feel in control or uh, or a sense of maybe revenge or, or empower empowerment. Um, I, yeah, I, I, was, I was addicted to, to the chase, I guess you can say, um, and just having something I shouldn't have had. And then, um, like I said, the, the sexual addiction, um, that started to introduce alcohol and, and drugs because it was all intertwined, you know. Alcohol, I learned at an early age that alcohol uh, broke down that wall for me. It, it gave me confidence, it gave me courage, it allowed me to be sociable, it allowed me to be funny. Everything that I wasn't before, I thought for, for many years, for, for a decade, I thought that you know alcohol was my friend. Alcohol made me into the person that I wanted to be, I thought I wanted to be. But I really just had a wall built up and um, alcohol was, was not good. I, I've, I've been in so many situations where, because I was the type of drinker that would black out. Most of the time I drank, I blacked out. I've woken up in bed with women completely naked and not known how I got there. That's happened many times. I've, I've gotten into fights and uh, broken people's property, punched holes in walls. Uh, a lot of anger would come out when I would drink. And that was, that was what led me to, to get kicked out of the military too. Um, I joined the military right out of high school and um, went to Thailand twice. And the uh, first time I went to Thailand, I, uh, I had been drinking all day. And um, by the end of the night, I left the club with a female. Uh, I would assume she was a hooker of some sort. She wasn't from the ship. She was a Thai girl. And I left the club with her and went to another spot. The spot that she took me to was a two-story building. And uh, the bottom floor was a bar and the top floor was, was a whorehouse. And, um, you know, while everyone else on the ship was doing fun things like kayaking and, and rock climbing and stuff, this is what I was doing. I was chasing, uh, chasing women, you know. Um, some of the story is a blur, uh, but I, I remember enough to tell it. I remember drinking on the, on the first floor with this woman and I remember following her upstairs. And when I get upstairs, this is where I black out. Um, something must have happened. Something must have set me off, made me angry or scared. Um, I remember being in a room, a small room, and I was trying to get out of the room and I couldn't get out. The door was locked, I, I couldn't find a way out. 
And I remember just being in a complete rage. I was throwing things in the room. I was breaking things. I was punching holes in the wall. Couldn't get out of this room. Uh, finally, I found a window and I busted out the window and uh, stepped outside of the window. And now I'm on the roof. I'm on the roof of this, this, uh, this building. And I'm, as I start walking across the roof to get away, I fall through the roof. The entire roof just collapses and I fall down to the first floor and, um, and then I black out again. And the next thing I remember being uh, arrested by Thailand police and escorted back to the ship. And uh, when I got to the ship and, and at least, you know, they sent me to medical, I was all scraped up and bruised. And um, I, when I started to sober up, I told them right away, I said, I, I wanna be drug tested. I, I wanna know if I was drugged. I wanna know what happened. And, uh, and they, wouldn't, they wouldn't test me, they wouldn't drug test me. They just wrote me off as a, a drunk mess and, and that's it. So still to this day, I, I don't know the details of that night, but chasing women and alcohol is what got me there. Um, luckily, the, the Navy didn't kick me out after that. They, they gave me a chance. They sent me to anger management through the military. They sent me to AA through the military. Um, they put me on restriction. I was in the military for two and a half years and for six months of that time, I was on restriction. I was always in trouble because of alcohol. Uh, restriction means I had a badge with a big R on it and I couldn't leave the ship. It wouldn't matter if we were home in San Diego or if we were out in another country, I couldn't leave the ship. I had to stay on the ship, do extra duty, stuff like that. So after I did my anger management, my AA, all my restriction, a year later, we're back in Thailand again. And um, because I did, you know, I finished all my punishment, I was able to go off the ship, uh, but I had to be back at a certain time this time. I didn't come back. I didn't come back to the ship. Uh, found myself with uh, women, again, Thai women. Um, this time uh, I got a hotel room with, with some friends and we brought a handful of hookers to the hotel room and, and uh, had a big orgy, recorded it all. That video is probably floating around somewhere, I don't know. Um, and I was supposed to be back on the ship and I stayed out. So when I finally did return to the ship, they had enough with me. Um, and this was what finally uh, sent me home. So I got kicked out of the military. And um, when I went home from the military, I finally decided that I wanted to settle down. I finally decided that I wanted to be with one woman and try to relax, stop the drinking, stop all that. And, and I got slapped in the face. Um, I, I met a girl at a restaurant I was working at. And um, any relationship that I had ever been in prior to the relationship I'm in now started with sex. All my relationships started with sex. That's how they started. Um, so I met this girl at a restaurant. We were working together. We started hooking up. And um, we were together seven months. She got pregnant. And I was looking forward to being a father. I was ready to settle down. I was gonna use this as something to be responsible for and, and to you know, have a, a bigger purpose in life than, than just party and sex. So uh, we, you know, we told the whole family, everybody was, was in tune with what was going on. We were gonna have a baby. And um, you know, we had some issues. As a matter of fact, right, right before she got pregnant, we had broke up uh, just for a short amount of time. And in that time, I was already sleeping with other women and she found out, so that was really hard for her to accept. She calls me up one night when she's pregnant and we're expecting the baby. And she says, I'm getting an abortion tomorrow morning and there's nothing you can do about it. And that was the last time that I ever seen or heard from her. So, slap in the face, you know, I finally tried to settle down and, and do that whole thing and, and it didn't work. So then, that's when I started doing drugs. That's when I started doing cocaine, uh, molly, ecstasy, uh, partying. Uh, stopped working for months, slept on my mom's couch. I was a bum. Uh, and the sexual addiction grew stronger. Um, I, I, at this time, I got into like meeting women on social media. And um, I, I would even meet women that lived out of state, out of California, and I would get them to fly to California just to be with me for the weekend. And, uh, and that was my thing. You know, I found enjoyment in that, um, just partying and sex, partying and sex, drugs, alcohol. Um, I was lost for a long time. My mom would come home from work and I'd have a woman on the couch. My mom would come home from being gone for the weekend and find me in her bed with another woman. It's, uh, 
that's disgusting, that's disrespectful, you know, and, and that's the behavior I was doing. Um, and then my mom finally had enough of that. She, uh, she kicked me out and uh, I went to go live with my dad. At this time, he's not in New Mexico anymore. He's now in Apple Valley, California. So I went to go live with my father. Um, and at this time in my life, I, again, was trying to clean up. I was trying to be sober. I was trying to stay away from women. And, um, you know, throughout all this, I, I've, I've never seen a counselor. I've never talked to a therapist, nothing. I've, I've tackled this on my own my entire life, just between me and God. I believe in God. I pray a lot. Um, I was raised in church, so that's something, you know, that my mom put in my life at a young age. And it's just been me and God the whole way, just a lot of prayer, a lot of uh, trial and error, a lot of failure. Um, but I never gave up on myself. At this time, I started to have this voice in my head, and, and, and God was telling me, I have something special for you, but you, you have to get clean, you have to be sober, and you have to stop chasing women. And, and that voice was so strong, man. Every time that I'd go out and do my thing, the next morning when I woke up hungover, I heard that voice, you gotta stop. I have something for you, I have something special for you, but you gotta stop, you gotta get clean. And I battled with that for years. And then, uh, and then I met a woman who's my wife now. And um, she was the most pure woman I've ever met. She was, she was good. She, she was not like any other woman I, that I had ever had a relationship with. And I knew that right away. And I knew that this was part of, you know, what God was telling me. And for the first time in my life, I was, I guess you could say, forced to fall in love with a woman without sex. My wife was a virgin when I met her, and, and I had no intentions on taking that from her. Um, so we, we were in a relationship, and, and we fell in love, and we built a friendship, and that was the first time I ever experienced that. So 10 years after this woman showed me how to love sexually, I meet another woman who shows me how to love without sex, and, um, and I needed that. That was, that was what changed a lot for me. And my wife, uh, she came into my life and she helped me with my sobriety. She helped me clean myself up. Um, and now we're married. Uh, we've been together nine years. We're married, we have a five-year-old boy. Um, I've been sober from drugs for five years. I'm still on my journey with alcohol. Um, I've, it's, I make it to like a year sober and then I, I have a relapse you know, at least once a year. It's been that, that way for the past five years. But I, I could honestly say I haven't been drunk in five years, but I, I slip up, you know, and I'm still on that journey. But I, I do plan on living a, a sober life from alcohol. And, um, you know, this year I'm picking myself up and, and making that attempt again. Um, but um, somewhere in there, where, where I met my wife and I, and, I, and I did get clean. At one point in my life, I was completely sober for two years. And during that time is when I found my uh, passion and my talent for, for music, for writing music. I'm a hip hop artist, I'm an independent hip hop artist. I've been making music for five years. As soon as my son was born and I found myself through sobriety and, and through prayer, um, I just, prior, to when my son was born, I had never wrote music. I had never tried to be an artist myself. I had, I mean, nothing at all. You could ask people who I grew up with, people from school, never at all. And once I was sober and my son was born, rhymes just started coming through my head. My mind was filled with rhymes all the time. All the time I was rhyming in my head, rhyming in my head. And, um, and I started to pay attention to it and then one night I was laying in bed, I couldn't sleep and I had these rhymes in my head. I pulled out my phone and I started writing my notes. And at that moment, I realized that, that God put something special in me that I couldn't see for years. You know, most, most artists, uh, most successful artists, hip hop artists, you hear their story, they've been doing it since they were 15, 16, 20. It was never like that for me. And I realized now it was because I was, I was distracted. I, I, I couldn't see anything in front of me because I was distracted. I was chasing women. I was drunk. I was on drugs. 
And as soon as I let all that go, I found what was inside me. And uh, I'm a phenomenal artist. I, I have a special way with words, with lyricism, storytelling. And uh, I believe I have a future ahead of me in music and, and I'm right in the middle of it right now. And um, I would have never found that if I didn't find sobriety, if I didn't let go of my addictions, if I didn't um, break that wall down naturally because alcohol broke that wall down, but I had to break that wall down on my own. How were you emotionally when you were going through that, that period? Oh. It, Between being a, a young teen and then meeting your wife? Um, at, like throughout the entire process. The, the sex addiction, the alcoholism. Emotionally, um, I, I mean, it sounds like fun for a lot of people, right? Yes, yes, that's a great point. Uh, you know, there's people that will listen to the story and, and say, you know, 36 year old woman at 15, that sounds like a great time. But for me, I always wanted better for myself. And I, and I knew that these things were toxic. Um, and, and I hope that I can be an inspiration and a message to other young men especially today, because in the world we live in today, sex is everywhere and it's accessible. When I was 15, I had to go out and find a porn magazine or, or watch a porn on TV, but today it's on your phone. Just pick it up, it's right there, it, right there in your reach. For little kids too. For little kids too, yeah. And I, I, I would like to be that message uh, to let young men know that it's, it's toxic. It, it might seem enjoyable, it might seem you know, that was, I think that was part of my uh, problem through all my addictions was, why should I not have this if I enjoy it? I enjoy it, why should I not have it? But sometimes things that we enjoy are toxic for us. And uh, sexual addiction is, is very toxic, especially pornography at a young age. It, it gives you a false reality of, of what a real relationship should be like. It uh, takes away from your natural confidence and, and your perception on what life really should be like and what a relationship should be like. And I had friends throughout my entire life that did the things I did and, and were totally okay with it. That was their lifestyle. But for me, I was always different. I always had this voice inside me that said, you need to do better. This is not good for you. You need to do better. And, um, and when I finally listened to that voice and I let go of all these toxic things in my life, I found my passion in life. I've, I found out that I could write music. I mean, I, I can't stress enough how incredible, when I, when I realized how talented I was with writing music, it was, it was emotional, I cried, I, I couldn't believe it. C coming from a kid with no confidence, a kid who would never step on a stage and, and tell his story or, or sit behind in front of a camera and tell his story, um, I, wasn't, I was never great at anything. I wasn't great at sports, I wasn't great at anything. I was just mediocre my whole life. And when I realized how well I could put words together and how well I could write music and rap, um, it was incredible. It, it, was like, it was like I found a hidden gem inside me. And, and now, hindsight, I, I know that it was always there because I was always infatuated with, with rap music, with music. I, I was always infatuated with lyricism and, and I would study artists and I would study their story and I would watch their, their documentaries. And I was much more into music than anybody around me. So it makes sense now. Now it makes sense. And, and, and at an early age, I would write little poems for my mom, stuff like that. And now it makes sense. It was always there. It was always there, but I couldn't see it. And it's almost like the sex addiction was just a distraction that kept you from finding it. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, that uh, you know, overpowered anything else that was in my life. I, I, I was chasing that adrenaline rush, that, that feeling that made me feel good. Coming from a child who was abused at home, bullied at school, no confidence, to now being able to please women. Because that was the thing for me. I, I didn't, it wasn't that I needed to be pleased. I wanted to please the woman. That was, that, and that's what she taught me, you know? And so through my sex addiction, it was about me pleasing a woman. I want to make you feel like you've never felt before. And that made me feel some type of way. Tony, what would you say is the most important lesson you've learned in all of this? It's, um, it's always been me versus me. You know, I could, I could blame it on my stepdad. I could blame it on her, but it's always been me versus me. I, I always had the angel on my shoulder. I always had that voice in the back of my head. I always had the desire to want to do better. 
And, and I was fighting myself the entire time. I was fighting myself the entire time. And you, you just have to reach a point where, where you're done beating yourself up. And you have to take control. You got to sit in the driver's seat and you have to take control and find a way to be disciplined. Find a way to be the one in control because it's you versus you. Your situations in your life may affect you and they may cause you to do these things, but you're in the driver's seat the whole time. The whole time. It's nobody else's fault but yours. It's nobody else's, it's in nobody's hands but yours. And if I could do it, anybody can do it. And I'm, I'm certainly not against therapy or, or having a counselor or anything like that, but I've never had one. Never had one. It was always me and prayer and just, just battling myself. And, and I got through it. I'm, I'm happy now. I'm sober. I have a beautiful wife, a beautiful son. I live a good life. And, and this life, as fun as that life sounded, all the women, all the partying, did I enjoy it during the time? Of course I did. But I'm so much happier now. I'm happier now. I'm complete. And I t I'll take this life over that life any day. Excellent story. Thank you. Tony, thank you so much for sharing it. Thank you for having me. Good luck with your music. Thank you.